So um, regarding chapter two, uh, any questions regarding chapter two? What we uh, what we learned just now, what we looked at, anything that you want to share also, that's also fine. Anything that you noticed, um, apart from questions, you know, you can share that as well. So, yeah. Um, okay, so so let, let me ask a question. So, see, Paul says that uh, I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. Okay, first, uh, that's how he starts, right? So, um, so does that mean that one should not uh, prepare to speak in a way that is good? or to communicate in a way that is clear or, or illustrate things in a way that people are able to understand. What do you think? You can either put it in the chat or you can what do you think? You know, so Paul says this. Yeah, I did not come with excellence of speech. That does not. Does that mean that I should not prepare? Uh, I should not, you know, uh, present things in an excellent manner. What do you think? Because it's uh, it's important we understand that correctly, right? Um, Anyone? So you tell me, is it is it okay to prepare? Is it okay to be, you know, to using Paul's, uh, you know, same words that he mentions there? Is it okay to be excellent in our presentation of the truth? Um, you know, is it okay to use technology, modern technology? Uh, science, right? Uh, whatever is available for us in order to present the gospel or to teach. Um, is it okay to do that? What do you think? Yes, Pastor, we can use that. Yeah. Whatever the technologies, whatever the things are available, we can use for the best presentation. Yeah. So, so what is it that we should not do? You know, that's the thing. So, Thomas, what do you think? Okay, um, so we can use this. But so what is Paul saying, you know, when he says, you know, I didn't come with excellence of speech. Okay, so when he says that, okay, what should I go with now? You know, as a person who is, uh, you know, God is called to teach or minister, you know, what should I do? Uh, for me, uh, if you ask me, Pastor, I have the message what we convey that should be led by the Spirit. We can use okay. the technology for the present in a way where people can understand easily. People can uh, grasp the things easily. But the message is supposed to be the cross or grace and uh, uh, that should be led by the Spirit of God. That that we cannot uh, do it in our own wisdom or strength. Only um, this can use to give in a right way where people can grasp. That's okay. my understanding first. Right, right. So, um, thank you, Thomas. So, we see some response here. Aaron, um, yes, demonstrate and display, but with the spirit. Dave, yes, absolutely, as long as it brings praise to care. Yeah, we're talking about the technology, yeah. Um, right. So, so, the, so, this is the difference, right? So, the difference is that you, we are not using human. See, um, today, uh, when, we, when we look around, you know, there could be messages, there are messages, which, which are like, just motivational messages, right? Um, these are just to motivate a person, or, or 
to make just to make a person feel good okay or the message can be just maybe sort of to entertain right rather than bring in edification for the person okay so so paul here is saying you know when i when he ministered uh, he did not do any of that okay so it does not mean that we don't use technology it does not mean that we we prepare well and present in an excellent manner that it does not mean that we should go unprepared right it does not mean any of that but it means that he how did he present it his determination was that or he he made a choice that people dependence should be on the power of god okay so any time we any any time or any method that we use to to kind of take the focus off that or uh if we substitute our you know our method or the kind of message that we are using if you are substituting that what does substitute mean something you bring in place of that right so if the the technology is to bring in place of that the actual message if it is there to replace that other then we are creating a wrong dependency that people are going to be dependent on human wisdom or human philosophy or or just the motivational aspect of it rather than the power of god and rather than the demonstration of the spirit right so so paul was very very clear saying that i i wanted to wanted people to know this i wanted people to receive this what is it jesus christ and him crucified so what came out of that right and and then he goes on to say in um was uh, um was five that your faith should not be sorry was four he says in demonstration of the spirit and of power right um was to jesus christ hand him crucified and then and him crucified so that is what i wanted you to know was for speech was with demonstration of uh, uh, of the spirit display of the holy spirit and with power which means that it was by faith and being led by the spirit being dependent on the spirit and uh, giving freedom to the spirit of god to move and minister then in verse 5 says that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men that the power of god so the faith of the people should be in the word of god be in the power of god he says very clearly that your faith should not be in the wisdom of man it should not be misplaced it should not be why because when when we place our faith or our dependency on the wisdom of man or on any of those methods then that is again cause for division you know that is what paul is saying uh, because uh, probably people were comparing and saying you know i'm of paul i'm of apollos you know apollos is a very articulate man or very eloquent man also uh, that is what is written of him right in 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 the book of acts we see that uh, when we when we read about apollos um, uh you know that's what people uh, uh people said apollos uh, sorry acts chapter 18 and verse 24 says now a certain jew named apollos born at alexandria an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures that is how he is introduced right eloquent man mighty in the in the scriptures um and he was fervent in spirit he spoke and taught accurately the things of the lord but he knew only about the baptism of john and then prisla akila take him aside teach him about uh, the baptism of the spirit the things of the spirit and so on and and he is he's he, was, uh, he did a, he had a powerful ministry right he vigorously refuted the jews publicly verse 28 showing them from the scriptures that jesus is the christ so so that such was a man okay now when you look at paul you know they they actually used to tell him that uh, you know his um, if you read the second corinthians i think you um, you know this is what they thought of him they uh, 
I'm just trying to get the reference. They say that um, you know his 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 words are mighty. Okay, Second uh, Corinthians chapter ten and verse ten. Okay, uh, for his letters they say are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Okay, so they were saying you know Paul, you know his writing his letters are all fine, but uh, when we look at him and his speech and everything, uh, it's not that impressive. So this is the Corinthian church. So probably, you know, they were they were putting their faith in, you know, in the talents or the ability of man. They were looking at, you know, things uh, superficially. They were, they were looking at the man, person, and saying, okay, he has his ability. He has his ability. Paul is like this. Apollos is like this. So I'm of Paul. You know, I I I prefer Paul's ministry. You know, have you seen his writings? I prefer Paul Apollos's ministry. You know, the way he speaks. Wow. So this was decided. This was dividing, right? The church. So Paul is saying, you know, I determine that that your faith should be in the power of God. Okay, it should be in the demonstration of the Spirit, the power of God. Okay, so uh, so that is why he mentions that. Okay. Okay, so uh, so chapter two, um, we we go on to chapter three. Chapter 2 ends like this. Who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Okay. In chapter 3, um, Paul goes on to talk about um, the, the division which was there. He goes on to talk about the kind of uh, immaturity that uh, immaturity that was there in the people right, and in the Corinthian church and so on. Okay. So let's read um, chapter 3. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you are not you were not able to receive it. And even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Okay, so here, uh, you know, uh, after talking about the wisdom of man, after talking about the wisdom of God, and uh, Paul says, you know, uh, when I was there, when I ministered to you, I could not speak to you as to spiritual people. Okay, I had a lot of things to talk teach you, but I could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal. Okay, carnal meaning fleshly, of the, of the flesh, not of the spirit. Okay, so he's saying, I had to talk to you in that manner. Okay, and uh, yeah, the, the word used there meaning something that is to do with the appetites of the body, something that is to do with uh, something that is unrenewed, Right, a mind that is unrenewed. On the, all that refers to carnality, uh, opposite of everything that is spiritual. So, he's saying, I could not speak to you as spiritual, but as to carnal. And see how he relates carnal to being babies or babes in Christ. Which means, uh, and he's saying babes in Christ, which means that people who are not mature, right? Um, Many times we see that, uh, uh, especially in in uh, the epistle that Peter writes, he refers to, you know, he refers to young men, he refers to fathers, uh, he refers to children, and these are writing to the church, and not necessarily people who are young or old, but people who are mature, and who are experienced, um, you know, are mature in Christ, and who are in different levels of growth so he calls you know children and young men and fathers and so on um so here we see that he's saying you know i could not speak to you as to carnal but as to babes in christ right i had to talk to you as i would talk to people who are not yet mature okay. and that cause for immaturity was because they were carnal 
Okay, and those, but but look at this thing. You know, they they uh, had the gifts of the spirit. They had, you know, they would move in the gifts. They would move in the anointing and all that. Yet they were carnal. Yet they were immature, childish. Right. So uh, Paul says, you know, I fed you with milk and not with solid food. For till now, until now, you were not able to receive. So he's saying it's not that you, you, you know, this is carnality. This um, fleshly nature is actually preventing you. Okay, it um, makes you unable to receive solid food. So that's the sad part of it, right? Uh, so you are you are saying you are babes in Christ, you are childish, you are carnal, and this carnality actually prevents you from receiving the solid spiritual fruit. It why why do we need solid spiritual food in order to grow, in order to mature? And this fleshly nature, this carnality, is actually preventing you, is stopping you from becoming all that you. Uh, are meant to become in Christ. This thing is preventing you to really um, become all that God wants you to become. Okay, so so that's something for us to understand. The seriousness of carnality, the seriousness of the you know giving into our fleshly nature, you know, and uh, of course it it refers to it refers to a lifestyle of sin or just you know giving into our fleshly appetite. And giving into a fleshly appetite is not of sins, not just you know sins of the sexual nature, but it also about division, envy, quarrelling, strife, right? Uh, like being a believer, but not speaking to certain people in the household, in the family, in our own family, right? That's a reality, right? Uh, it could be a you know maybe a pastor, maybe a minister, but then. Um, the person does not have great relationship with the in-laws. You know, it's like just decided not to speak to them. Does not speak to them. You know, that's that's being carnal. That's being immature, and that prevents us from receiving solid food. It's not that God does not want to give. Like Paul is saying, I I could not. Right, uh, I had to feed you with milk, and not with solid spiritual food. Because you are not able, you're unable to receive it. This is preventing you. Okay, um, so that's a serious thing. So he's saying, you know, uh, where for you are still carnal. Okay, he goes on to describe it, where there are envy, strife, which means envy is jealousy. You're jealous about one person and the other. There is strife, meaning there is quarrelling, and uh, there is division. So you are divided. Are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? You, you are actually born again believers. You have the spirit of God dwelling in you. Um, but your behaving, your behavior, your life, uh, and the things that you do, you are actually behaving like mere men, as of people who do not know God. Right? You're behaving like that. You have the gifts of God. You are enriched in all knowledge and utterance. Chapter 1. Right? You come short in no gift. In chapter 3, saying you are behaving like mere men. You have all this. You have inherited all this. You have the mind of Christ. But in your behavior, because of this carnality that you are indulging in, strife and fighting, division, you are behaving like mere men. Okay? So that's the thing. If there is envy, if there is strife, if there are divisions, uh, it could be a very spiritual church, spiritually vibrant church. Yet there is carnality. And that church will remain that way, unable to receive solid food. Okay? So as leaders, we need to ensure to bring an end to you know, these kind of things, to carnality and, and you know, it's a process. It's a journey, but we need to do that. Okay. So he's saying, verse four: For one, for when one says, "I'm of Paul," and another, "I'm of Apollos," are you not carnal? Okay. Then he goes on to say in verse five: Who then is Paul? 
okay answering that asking that question who then is paul and who is apollos but ministers through whom you believed as the lord gave to each one i planted apollos watered but god gave the increase so neither he who plants is anything nor he who waters but god who gives the increase now he who plants and he who waters are one and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor for we are god's fellow workers you are god's field you are god's building according to the grace of god which was given to me as a wise master builder i have laid the foundation and another builds on it but let each one take heed how he builds on it okay so so we see here so uh, several things that we learn okay so he is answering that question who is paul who is apollos okay, he is putting things in perspective you okay, don't elevate us don't you know exalt us more than we are supposed to be you know so he's saying we are ministers or we are servants okay we are ministers we came to serve we came to minister and through whom you believed yes right we came we served you believed and he says you know and as the lord gave to each one in the sense the ministry is what was given by the lord he is the one who gave the ministry he is the one who led us to minister to you he is the one who enabled us to minister right the lord gave to each one so this is the lord who called us he is the boss in other words right so paul is saying you know what is the kind of ministry was six i planted which means i came here i preached the gospel i started the work here i planted the church i planted and then you know we read in acts chapter 18 or 19 that apollos visited corinth when paul was in ephesus right so i planted apollos watered right so he is referring to a field uh, referring to a, maybe a garden so you plant something uh and then someone else watered it and he, and then he says but god gave the increase that change that transformation the gifts of the spirit and the move of the spirit and everything the increase comes from him man cannot bring that increase right so he's putting things in perspective god gave the increase so then neither he who plants is anything nor he who waters but god who gives the increase so one who plants one who waters you know they they cannot say that i'm you know i'm someone big or i'm someone great because it is god who gives the increase and that greatness and the glory and the fame goes to god right so he's putting things in the right perspective here about the people who minister about the church and he's saying you know don't say i am of paul i am of apollos we are all one he says verse 8 now he who plants and he who waters are one but each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor now we are all in the same team the one who's planting the one who's watering they might be different people uh, but they are ministers and as god called and he's the one who gives the increase right and he's saying that uh planting watering these are one thing one one ministry one task okay uh, now so you cannot say planting is you know better than watering watering is watering is more important planting is more you cannot say that because it's all one right and he's saying each one will re- receive his own reward from the lord he's the one who's rewarding according to his labor Okay, according to the kind of work they put in, according to the kind of ministry that they do, each one will receive his own reward, his own uh, reward according to the labor. And then he goes on to say, "No, this is how you must consider us." Okay, verse nine: We are God's fellow workers. Now, we are God's fellow workers, meaning that we are actually God's team. We are in God's team. We are God's fellow workers. We are co-laborers. co-workers or colleagues in today's term right? we are in the same office right we are working for the same cause we are god's fellow workers co-laborers co-workers um 
and you are God's field. Okay, God's field. You are God's building. Okay, you, I'm sure you would have learnt in Kingdom of God, Kingdom Builders, right? So the thing is that the church, the body of believers, uh, they are actually God's property. Okay, whether it's a field or a building. So he's giving a picture of a field, meaning, you know, a plant's growing, a crop that's growing. So, the you know, the one who's coming and doing the watering and the, and the you know, uh, the planting and the watering and so on. Uh, the minister, different ministers coming and doing. But the field belongs to God. And same in the, in the case of building. So he's talking, he's giving a, you know, different pictures here for the, for the people to understand uh, about the body of believers. He's saying, you are God's building. So saying that the building belongs to God. You are God's field, meaning the field belongs to God. He owns. Right? It's not Paul or Apollos. We are workers who have been sent by God. But God owns you. Right? You belong to God. You are God's field. You are God's building. And he says, according to the grace of God, the enabling power of God, the charis of God that he gave me, I, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. The foundation, which is Christ. There's no other foundation. Like he goes on to say that also. Uh, there is no other foundation. Uh, Verse 11, he says, there's no foundation apart from Christ. So I laid the foundation. Okay, I shared the gospel. I laid the foundation. I started the work. And he'll go on to say, you know, as the building comes up, maybe another person comes and builds. But I laid the foundation, which is Christ. Another person might come and build. Now be careful how you build it. Because this is God's building. The building belongs to God. The field belongs to God. So wonderful, you know, like if you have that perspective, then, you know, we will not misuse or abuse the people who we are serving right? as ministers of God. Like we will not boss over them. We will not treat them wrong. Um, you know, we will not extract from people because we will understand that he, they belong to God. They belong to Jesus. Right? This is field. It's got God's name on it. I'm here to serve. I'm here to help. I might be doing all these things. Yes, uh, you know, preparing, serving, helping, all that. And and yeah, the people will honor. But if they're going to exalt or honor beyond, you know, a certain level, then that's not healthy, that is unnecessarily bringing in division. Right? And that's keeping the people carnal. That's keeping them, suppressing them, because they're not able to receive the solid food that God has for them. Right? So we learn so many things here. Okay, let's look at verse uh, verses 11 onwards. Okay, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Okay, So Meaning Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ is the foundation. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which is built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved yet so as through fire. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Okay, some very strong words here. And also some great revelation about the church, about the people of God, and how we as ministers should consider the, the people of God. And how the people of, uh, you know, people whom uh, we are ministering to, how they should actually look at the ministers, right? That they are co-workers, co-laborers with God. 
sent by God. All that is true, but that that is the thing. You know, they are, the work that they're doing, we have no right to compare because one could be doing the work of planting, the other one could be doing the work of watering. But it is God who brings the increase. So we understand that. Here, Paul is using the other picture, which is of that of a building. And he says, okay, um, no other foundation can anyone lay except that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. So there is no other foundation apart from Jesus Christ. So, so that's the thing, you know, when, when a work is done, when we're, when we're through preaching and so on, we understand that uh, the foundation stone has to be Christ. The foundation is important. Okay, so uh, there can be no other foundation. It starts with uh, the Lord Jesus. Only if that is done, it is, it is strong. Okay, so, um, so, so it says that this is the foundation. So, which means the message, uh, making sure that people are born again and this one. So that's the foundation of the building, right, uh, of the church that you get people share the gospel get uh, you know uh, uh, ensure that they receive the gospel and of course it's up to them to uh, to act on it to decide on it to choose christ it's it depends on them but uh thing is to lay that foundation which is christ the dependency on christ right so he's the foundation now he says if anyone builds on this foundation so different people with God can use you to lay the foundation and God can use different other people to build the building, right? So it refers to ministering, it refers to teaching, preaching, etc. And look at that, you know, he uses different materials there saying, uh, if anyone builds on this foundation with, you know, different kinds of material, he's saying, okay, with gold or silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw. Okay, so some materials you see are good okay they are precious uh, some are strong and some are not right so it refers to it can refer to a few things right it can refer to the motive or the intention with which a minister ministers okay the motives are not pure so therefore the work is not great okay um, you're not there to build but you're there to take Right? So the motives are not pure. It also refers to the kind of ministry. You know, what What are you actually ministering? What are you building? Right? Um, what is the nature of the work? Are people being built strong? Are people, is there Christ-likeness? Okay. So, or, you know, typically if you're looking at a pulpit ministry, you know, is it, it's just something to entertain people. People are coming, entertaining, getting entertained, getting becoming happy. Uh, you know, some motivational thing, and then they are going back. Okay. So, if if that is the case, it will not be strong. The building will not be strong. It will not last. Okay, he says, each one's work will become clear. Verse thirteen: For the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire. The fire will test each one's work. Okay. So, uh, when there are challenges, and it's typically re referring to the day of the Lord's return. Okay. So, where the Lord will come and, and, and look at the believers, judge the believers, and, uh, and look at their lives, right, and see what they have done with their lives. And, you know, will people endure in their lives? Will they, will, uh, you know, will, will they stand the test of time? Will they endure? And it says that, uh, so the work will become clear. The work of the minister will become clear on that day. Okay, uh, If there's anyone's work endures, or you know, the person stays true um, to the faith till the end, well, the minister receives a reward. But if anyone's work is burned, you know, he suffers loss, but he himself will be saved. Yes so as yet so as to fire okay so so the thing is this we must be the minister of god must be clear must be careful how he minister he or she ministers right um with what do we build okay is it by 
the resources, spiritual resources of word and spirit, uh, which beautify, which make people strong and uh, which draws them to Christ-likeness? Or is it with substandard material? Right? Is it with some material, you know, sometimes we, you know, you know, building a people, building a house or building some building we build and then very soon there are cracks like you see those deep cracks on the wall why the material use was not proper okay the paint is peeling because there was only one coat it is chipping off or if there is a rain then then water is seeping in because there is water logging water seepage because it's very porous right the wall the stones are just allowing the water to come in so so the thing is paul is saying you know be careful with what you build you know are you doing it with the right motive are you doing you know is your labor uh, good labor because each one will receive according to their labor each resort to what they will receive according to their own labor um, so he's saying you know don't be motivated by the flesh in your ministry don't choose a method or uh, you know that appeals to the flesh um, and the method of working the method of ministering you know if if you feel that okay you know it's it's not right then you need to change right so we see all this okay then uh, verse uh, um um yeah we look at verse 16 okay do you not know that you are the temple of god and that the spirit of god dwells in you if anyone defiles the temple of god god will destroy him for the temple of god is holy which temple you are okay so he's he's saying do you not know that you are the temple of god so here you know a couple of places actually paul um uh tells the people, you know, you are the temple of God. Here, he's talking to them collectively, you know, as a group. Um, another, another place, which is chapter 6 and verse 19, uh, he says that, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Okay, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And here and there, he's talking about them individually. You know, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So do not... Uh, you know, so glorify God in your body, in your spirit. Don't sin. Keep away from sexual immorality. Right? Spirit of God dwells in you. Here, he's talking about them collectively as a church. Right? That you are the temple of God. So he uses different pictures. Right? He said, you are God's field. You are God's building. And here he says, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Um, that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you, right? So collectively, uh, as a church, the spirit of God moves and works and he dwells in you. If anyone defies the temple of God, defiles the temple of God, you know, um, so if anyone, you know, messes with the temple of God and does anything to corrupt, okay, um, the word he uses there, uh, the the file is you know to make it wither to make it spoil to uh, ruin it okay so so he's referring to people again you know it's not talking about a physical building wrong people if they, if if a minister does anything or if a, another believer does anything to ruin the people of god right to make them the opposite of thriving, you know, to make them wither, uh, they're not growing. So if anyone defiles the temple of God, he's saying, uh, God will destroy. Okay. Very hard, very strong words, right? If anyone defiles, God will destroy him. If anyone does anything to manipulate them, to, uh, you know, to defile them, to destroy the people, to hurt the people, um, you know, intentionally, not for edification, but, you know, to to do this, then he says that God will destroy. So be careful, right? Verse 18, let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. 
the wisdom of this world is foolishness with god for it is written he catches the wise in their own craftiness and again the lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are futile therefore let no one boast in men for all things are yours whether paul or apollos or cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come all are yours and you are christ and christ is god's okay so um so so this is the thing so he is saying that uh, no one deceive himself okay don't deceive yourself don't uh, uh don't just fool yourself okay um so he's saying that uh, if if any of you seem to be wise in this age then you need to actually you know if if you if you're thinking you're wise according to the worldly ways and so on you need to change you know you become wise according to god's ways which means you become a fool that he, he may become wise right you become a fool in the sense in, in other words he's just saying that you change your ways right you change your ways and um uh, and then he references uh, two scriptures there uh, where he you know where is uh, he ca- catches the wise in their own craftiness and the, the lord knows the thoughts of the wise and they are fut- futile you know he's referring to job 5 and and psalm 94 and and uh, and then he says let no one boast in men okay so this is the final thing you know because they were boasting in man okay uh um, sorry manu's question so verse 16 or 17 talking about one people or church okay so so the yeah, this chapter is talking about the church where he's saying you are god's field you are god's building you are the temple of god so he's talking about uh, the church collectively um here okay so if you look at uh, chapter 6 and verse 19 there he's talking about the individual the person the believer okay but of course we can you know who, who is the church church is the body of christ and they are believers right individually <coughs> excuse me so uh but you know so we can use it we can say okay um the temple of god because he's your same reference that god so here he's particularly pointing to the fact that spirit of god dwells in you collectively as a body of believers so let no person defile the body of christ let no person you know mess with the you know uh, defile or make uh, or ruin or you know corrupt the temple <coughs> excuse me okay okay so verse 21 says let no one boast in men you know don't boast in man don't boast in a minister of god okay for all these things are yours so as a minister of god the value the identity you know does not come from the people or the things that they do because it it's been given to us by god right we belong to him everything that we have uh, comes from him so we we cannot we don't have to boast about the person boast about man right either our, our, about ourselves or about others because all things uh they're all yours in the sense that you know he's saying um, apollos paul cephas uh everything you know it's yeah it's it's all ours and uh, it belongs to god we all belong to him so it really you know there's no cause for boasting there's no reason to boast okay so um so we so Paul actually comes and and he he teaches uh, about the about he addresses the whole thing of division he he teaches them how they should look at or consider ministers of god and also how ministers of god also should consider you know god's people or, or the, the ones to whom they are ministering and uh, and and then finally he says you know don't boast in man okay 
So he's still talking about addressing the whole issue of division, the carnality that is there in the church. Okay, uh, let's just look at it, uh, just back up a little. I just, uh, you know, in the notes, just uh, notice something here that, uh, yeah, I uh, just wanted to talk about verse 16, okay, that you are the temple of God. So um, so Paul uses the, the Greek word now as referring to the, the innermost sanctuary. Okay, the most holy place. So where accessibility is given only to the to the high priest, right? Um, so not everyone can go there. So so here he's saying uh, he's talking to the uh, uh, to the local church, I mean to the church and to the to the believers, and he's saying that okay. Um, there's no there's no question of anyone defiling this you know this holy place um and that's the level of holiness that god sees uh, he is coming to dwell among and among the people so and he's saying you know one cannot destroy one cannot um, uh, morally corrupt one cannot mess with the people of god Okay, so uh, we see that um, um, the importance of that, the seriousness of it, okay, because um, because it, I think uh, many times people take it lightly and therefore you know take people for granted, take people of God God for granted, and use people really and. Um, you know, sometimes and many people's lives are destroyed, um, and uh, people are misused, abused, and so on. Right? Uh, but that should not be so. Okay, uh, because God considers uh, people as His people, right? As His field, as His building, as His dwelling place, which is the temple of God. Okay. So that is what we see here. Um, we'll uh, we'll stop here. And uh, any questions? Any questions that you might have? Okay. Um, just want you to take note of you know make note of any questions um, that you might have, and then you know we can uh, talk about it in the next session also. Um, any any questions? Any doubts? Or anything that you notice that. Um, you know that um, as we were reading, as we were learning, something that you know spoke to your heart, and something that you noticed for the first time. You know, just make a note of that as well, and uh, we you can share that in the next session, next class, right? Okay, so we'll um, okay, so we'll stop here. Uh, let me just uh, stop the recording, and um, okay.